Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today. Um, it's my pleasure to begin the third webinar of our third series of webinars with our own experts from the Hebrew University. Today we have the great pleasure to host Professor Katrina Lijet from the Hebrew University's Department of Computer Science, the Federman Center of the, for the Study of Rationality. Professor Lijet research focuses on our algorithmic game theory and privacy. Her lecture will focus on COVID-19 math, why social distancing matters and why it's not a quick fix. After the, the lecture, as usual, you're welcome to ask a question by raising your digital hand. And uh, thank you to all of you for participating. Professor Lijet, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so the presentation that I'll be giving today is something that I put together with my colleague Aviv Zohar in the computer science department. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we were talking in the hallway back when we were at work and roaming the hallways and talking to people in the hallways. Um, and we, we were reflecting that both of us teach about mathematical models of epidemics in courses that, that we offer at the Hebrew University. And we felt that there weren't a lot of materials at the time online that were doing a good job of explaining um, the basic mathematics behind how epidemics spread and how we model them and some insights that can come from them. Um, in particular, we, we noticed that there really weren't a lot of materials available in Hebrew. So we put together this slide deck. Um, there's a version in English and also a version in Hebrew. Um, we've put both of them on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube and search our names, you'll find both the English and the Hebrew versions. Um, and so if this is something you're interested in, in seeing again or sharing with a friend, um, feel free to look up the YouTube versions of these. Um, but all of this work is, uh, is joint, a uh, joint effort with Aviv. So thanks Aviv. So uh, first question is probably why, why are computer scientists talking at all about epidemics? Um, and one answer is that computer scientists like epidemiologists are also really interested in studying models of how things spread. Um, for us, usually we're talking about things like memes and information, ideas, computer viruses, um, but we use really the same basic models as epidemiologists use to study biological viruses and how they spread. So uh, generally there are two phases to controlling the spread of a pandemic. Um, first, the first phase is when the virus hasn't spread to very many people. And in that case, you try to contain it. You try to isolate the infected people from the healthy people in hopes that the virus might just die out without infecting very many people at all. Um, and, but unfortunately, with the current coronavirus, and uh, this is a slide that we pulled from Johns Hopkins um, back on March 13th, uh, when, when things were looking bad already, but uh, the, the map looks much more red today. Um, unfortunately, we're really past that stage where containment is an option. Too many people are infected in too many places for the virus, virus to be isolated effectively. Um, and so we've moved on to the second phase, which gets known in some, some uh, literatures as mitigation. Um, and the goal in the mitigation phase is to slow the spread of the virus enough that the healthcare system is not overwhelmed, and so that there are enough hospital beds and protective gear and ventilators and medications for those who need them. And it's also a goal there to buy time in order to put procedures in place to care for the most vulnerable. Um, slowing the spread of the virus can also buy time until a vaccine is invented. And as we'll see shortly, slowing the spread of the virus can also help reduce the total number of people who ever get infected with the disease. A simple epidemiological model can help give some insight into the importance of mitigation. The model we'll look at here is known as the SIR model. For S, susceptible, I, infectious, R, recovered. In this model, susceptible people are healthy and haven't had the virus, so they're not immune yet. Infectious people are those who are sick with the virus and can give it to others. And we think of people as recovered once they've had the virus and can't get again or give it to others. Either they're immune or they're dead. At first, one person is sick and everyone else is susceptible. A sick person, maybe they don't even realize yet that they're sick, meets a bunch of people during the time in which he's contagious. Maybe he goes to work and interacts with colleagues. Maybe he has dinner with his extended family. This sick person goes on to infect some fraction of the people he meets, 
and they become sick. The sick person recovers and becomes immune to the virus, but the new sick people go on to infect others. The number of people that a sick person typically infects is known as R0, written R0, the basic reproductive number of the disease. As long as sick people each typically infect more than one new person, meaning the effective reproductive rate R is bigger than one, the virus will continue to spread. But if a sick person typically infects less than one new person, meaning the effective reproductive number is less than one, the virus will start to fade away. Suppose, for example, that each sick person infects two new people and that the process of those new people getting infected and becoming contagious takes six days. On the first day, we'll have one sick person. On the seventh day, we'll have two. On the thirteenth day, four. On day 19, we'll have eight sick people. So far, it doesn't seem too bad, but at this rate, on day 187, we would have more than two billion sick people. That's exponential growth. So although in this model it took us about 60 days to get our first thousand patients, the second thousand only took six more days. And although it took us about 120 days to get our first million patients, the second million only took six more days, and so on. This type of growth will quickly overwhelm any medical system. In order to slow the growth, it's useful to reduce the number of susceptible people that a sick person might meet, using social distancing measures like staying home and closing schools. Hygiene measures like hand washing reduce the chance that a susceptible person will actually be infected when she meets a sick person. Even small changes in social distancing and in the rate of infection can have a dramatic impact. Suppose instead of an average of two new infections per sick person, we could get that down to an average of one and a half. In the previous model, the virus would have hit two billion patients at around day 187. But in this new, slower spread model, the number of sick people at that point would only be about 287,000, much more manageable. The other key aspect of the model is that once someone has had the virus, they generally can't be reinfected. If more than half of the population is already recovered and immune from the virus, typically at least one of the two people a sick person originally would have infected would already be immune, and thus she will only transmit the virus to less than one new person. That reproductive rate of less than one will make the virus fade away quickly. Of course, people who are very socially active or who meet many people in the course of their work are at risk of continuing the epidemic. Given this model, we can use math and computer simulations to get predictions of how an epidemic might progress. Of course, the predictions are only as good as the model, and the model we are using here makes a number of simplifying assumptions. You can see here that using a reproductive number of 2, the SIR model predicts that there will be a catastrophic blow-up in the number of cases around day 190 when nearly 16% of the world's population is infectious simultaneously, vastly more than the medical system could possibly cope with. And then the virus will only die off once about 80% of the population has had it. Using instead a reproductive rate of one and a half, there will still be a substantial blow up in the number of cases from around day 350, but then the virus will die off once about 59% of the population has had it. Suppose we've been going along with a reproductive rate of 2, and then at around day 104, when we have around 200,000 global patients, we rapidly implement extreme measures to reduce the reproductive rate to just one half. Um, because there aren't yet enough immune people in the population, what the model predicts at that point is that the virus would quickly spiral out of control again. And a similar effect could happen if the reproductive rate were lowered, not just because of political uh, interventions, but say if there were warmer weather and the virus happened to spread less quickly in the summer, 
but then later return to a higher reproductive rate in the fall. The epidemic could return and could return really in full force. So there are a number of takeaways from this simple model that I want to share. So first, on the positive side, social distancing and good hygiene really can save lives. Um, you're not only reducing your chance of getting the coronavirus by staying home and wearing a mask or whatever it is that you're doing in your, in your locality, you're reducing the chances of giving it to your friends and family, you're helping make sure that the virus doesn't overwhelm our medical system, you're helping reduce the total number of people who will ever have to get the disease because you're reducing the number of people who will need to have it before we get to the point of herd immunity. And you're increasing the chances that we successfully wait it out until there's an effective vaccine. Um, the second message is sort of a sobering one, which is that extreme quarantine is not something that we do for a couple of weeks and then stop and the virus is gone. And I, perhaps we've all, all already gotten to the point where that's more clear than it was a few weeks ago when we first put this presentation together. Um, but if you take these extreme measures just for a few weeks, then, and you sort of return to normal life, after that, and normal life really has the same re reproductive rate as before, we're gonna see the outbreak come right back. Um, and so some sort of measures need to be in place either until an effective vaccine has been developed and widely deployed or until a, a substantial fraction of the population has already had the disease. And since the point of these interventions is to make sure that the disease spreads slowly, herd immunity also comes slow. This is herd immunity, if you have a low R, is not going to come in a matter of weeks or even months, or not very few months. So our best hope, I think, is to try to replicate the effects of our current extreme quarantines um, by instead making those measures more targeted. Um, in order to support that, uh, we're going to need much, much more extensive testing, um, and we'll need to think hard about what it means to target. Uh, but potentially this could allow many people to return to something resembling their normal lives and for the economy to continue functioning. functioning. Um, <clears throat> and when we think about how to sort of track our quarantine, one of the issues that I want to sort of raise is that we really need to be careful not to blindly embrace widespread surveillance measures that might undermine our privacy, our democracies, and our freedoms. Um, I hope that you found this exploration of this model useful and interesting. I wish you good health and I look forward to hearing your questions. So I'm looking at the chat right now if anyone wants to enter a question in chat. Great, okay, so there's a question from, from Lawrence. Um, the question is, could the virus come back such like a boomerang in China? So I think what, what you're asking is sort of, could we, could we see this second bump um, occur in China? And, and my answer but, um, to this question is potentially yes. Um, un, unless we somehow have really underestimated how many people are already immune to the disease, which is possible, then as restrictions are lifted in China, if they're lifted too dramatically um, and too quickly, then I would expect that we would see a sudden bump. Um, and we've seen the Asian countries that have sort of managed to get things under control now seem to be rightly so quite nervous and quite cautious about the disease being sort of reintroduced, for example, by people returning from the West. Um, and Right now, I, I don't know what the strategy of those countries is going to be going forward longer term, but they seem to be relaxing very carefully uh, the types of restrictions. Um, I, we do see some, some restrictions coming up, um, being, being lifted, but I imagine that the goal is really to try to keep that R below one as much as possible. 
Um, one of the aspects of the of this model, as I presented it, is, is really simplified and that it doesn't show any sort of social structure. Um, it doesn't reflect the fact that some people are different from others, some people have more social contacts than others. Um, you can incorporate that into a more sophisticated version of the model and then you have to worry not just about getting sort of the overall or average number of contacts down, but you have to worry about this sort of potential of a handful of individuals for, to, uh, to potentially push the, the epidemic further. But yes, the, the short answer is I, I think it's possible that we see, would, would see and will see sort of second spikes, perhaps in China, perhaps elsewhere. Okay, um, there are a lot of questions that have accumulated here. Let me try to, to get to some of them. Um, so I, let me see. Is there any way for the model to incorporate the degree of severity of infection? Um, so there are lots of ways that you can potentially modify the model. Um, what I showed here is really the, the simplest version. Um, and you can potentially use this model to try to I have more than just the three categories of individuals. Perhaps you have some individuals who are higher risk or lower risk. Perhaps you use the model to uh, give you some predictions about the number of high risk patients and how many ICU beds you'll need. You can do a lot of extensions of this and um, there's very sophisticated epidemiological modeling that's being done that uses this model as sort of a jumping off point. My, my point in showing you the, the most basic version of the model is that already in this incredibly stripped down version, you can already get some useful intuition to understanding sort of the dynamics of the spread of the disease. Um, I'm seeing, uh, okay, so, so I think one question that I'm seeing here is, well, what if, what if we don't find a vaccination um, in the near future? Uh, and, and I think the, the short answer is if, if we're not gonna get a vaccination, then probably we'll slowly get ourselves to herd immunity to the point where enough people have the disease that it's not spreading dramatically or potentially even dies out um, or pretty much close to dies out. Um, if we're doing things in a controlled fashion, meaning we're not letting the disease sort of run rampant through all of the population or large swaths of the population, it'll take substantial time to get to that point um, but at that point, it potentially, even without an immunization, becomes something that we can live with as a society. Um, <clears throat> there's, uh, here's a question. Is there a mathematical answer as to the ratio of people that need to be tested to make a difference? So there are a few possible interpretations of the phrase make a difference. Let me give my own interpretation of what you might have meant. And then if you want to clarify, I hope I will find it in all of the questions that are appearing in the chat. I apologize if I'm not hitting your question. There are a lot of them popping up all at once. Um, so uh, the question of how many people you need to test um, is, is in some sense I, a, a question of statistics. Uh, how many samples do you need to take in order to have a fairly accurate understanding of the prevalence of the disease and you don't just need to know the prevalence of the disease, but potentially you need to be able to spot outbreaks. You potentially need to be able to understand its prevalence in various sectors of the population in order to do some better prediction of the, the needs of your medical system. So we do have statistical tools that allow us to answer this question of how many people you need to test in order to give very accurate uh, guarantees of the, on, the, on the estimates you get for these various uh, types of statistics. One of the problems though is that uh, the basic assumption of these types of statistical tests is that we're able to sample sort of at random the individuals that we test and that's not entirely realistic. And also generally when you draw conclusions from the results of those tests, usually what gets done is you assume that the disease has infected people at random. And especially at this point in the beginning, I think that's not an accurate assumption. So in order to be conservative, you have to sort of add to the error um, that you estimate uh, from, from these tests. And it increase the number, increases the number of tests that you need to do in order to have more confidence in the results that you're getting. 
Okay, so we have a question about what's the actual R naught across the world? Um, what's the effect of R in various countries? Uh, so I've seen a wide range of estimates. One of the reasons why it's very hard to get a good estimate of, I, of these values is that we don't actually really have a very good sense of how many people have the disease, almost anywhere. Um, testing has just not been extensive enough. So it's possible there are many people who've been low symptomatic or asymptomatic, as you may have heard, who have the disease. We don't really have extraordinarily good estimates, I think, of, of the extent. The range of r naughts that I've seen in papers, you know, pre-intervention ranges for some, from something like two to something like six. Um, so I used two here to be on the sort of conservative side. Um, the effective R under various interventions, um, I haven't tried to calculate that and I haven't seen somebody do it, um, but one could do it fairly easily if one believes that the numbers being reported in terms of the number of cases that we're seeing in the region that you're looking at are actually accurate. And again, I don't know that they are. Um, I don't know that testing is extensive enough really anywhere for us to be confident that we're really understanding how many people have the disease. Let's see, there are so many questions here. Let me try. Um, okay, so, so there's a question of what happens um, when, when the R naught or the effective R, I think you mean, goes below one. So what happens when the effective reproductive rate goes below one, meaning on average, an infected person infects less than one more person, is that the number of infected people goes down very quickly. Um, we saw this happen actually um, on the slide where I so said, let's start with an effective R of two, let's in implement some interventions to get it to one half. And we saw this peak that went down dramatically quickly. So we saw the exponential growth and we saw the exponential decay. That exponential decay is what you see when you have an R of less than one. Um, so if you can get yourself to an R of less than one, it, the number of cases is still going to go up the, the total number of people who have the disease, uh, or ooh, sorry, who have had the disease will keep on increasing. You'll have more infected people every day for a long period of time, potentially, um, but it'll be fewer and fewer um, per day, the sort of additional people who you add for, uh, added to that infected or recovered group. Um, There are many questions. Let me try to grab some more of the ones that came in earlier that I missed. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> so there are a number of questions that relate to uh, drug treatments. I haven't done any modeling of, of drug treatments and this is extremely far from my expertise. Um, so unfortunately, I don't think I have good answers uh, for those types of questions. Um, there's a question about mutation, um, which is a great one. So the, the model that I presented is one in which people, once they have the disease, have recovered. Um, and where the sort of the r naught of the disease doesn't change over time. Um, but if this disease does mutate substantially, a number of things could potentially change that could completely change uh, the course of the epidemic. The disease could become less deadly. The disease could be, become more deadly. The disease could become one that spreads more quickly or less quickly. Um, and also people who previously had immunity could no longer be immune to the new variant of the disease. Um, and so this is one thing to keep in mind, sort of a cautionary, uh, a cautionary word for anyone who's thinking about a strategy that relies heavily on herd immunity is that we don't know how effective it's going to be and for how long. I mean, it, it may still be a necessary tool in our arsenal, but it's, it's something to, to keep in mind. Um, I apologize to the person who said there's an issue with the sound. Um, I hope that's resolved. Um, 
So, so someone asked specifically about India's 21-day uh, lockdown. Um, I don't know a lot of details uh, in particular about India. I've only read a few articles about India. Um, what I can say is that generally, I think that it a substantial uh, social distancing program is the right course for getting things under control initially. Um, I don't know that India is implementing it in the optimal fashion and the way it's being implemented in India may have severe, severe economic consequences. I can't really speak to that specifically. I just don't know enough. Um, but I do think that substantial social distancing measures are the right course at sort of at this point in time, um, approximately, for getting things under control, getting a better sense of the spread of the disease, uh, marshalling our resources, formulating a plan. And then we, but we do need to formulate a plan. Um, we can't shut the economy down entirely um, for the length of time that would be required to get to herd immunity. Um, so we need to think, how do we step out from here? Um, will the slides be available from uh, after the webinar? I don't know if that's something that's generally done. I'd be happy to share them. Um, if not, I, but also there's a YouTube video. Uh, so if you're interested in seeing me do this again, uh, there's another version of it that's up on YouTube. Um, the, I think the, the really tricky question that everyone's grappling with right now is how do we step out of the lockdown? I mean, some places really haven't even gotten their lockdown in place. Um, but once you get the lockdown in place and functioning where things are relatively under control, then how do you get out of there and get back to uh, a functioning economy? Um, someone asked in somewhere in, in this uh, pile of questions, someone asked about uh, specifically trying to isolate the, the high risk individuals, those who are older or have pre-existing conditions. I think definitely any strategy will have to emphasize protections and, uh, and heavily emphasize protections for the high risk in individuals um, because there are folks who really do tend to get very sick and, and die at in frightening rates from, from this disease. I'm not sure how successfully we can really completely isolate uh, the high risk population. Um, the countries that have gone this route have backed away from it so far, um, but I know people are continuing to, to think hard about the extent to which it's possible and desirable to really basically completely separate the high-risk individuals from the rest of society um, in order to allow the disease to spread more freely in the rest of society where it can have fewer, um, fewer deaths and uh, fewer negative consequences. Um, to allow us, the rest of society to potentially build up that herd immunity more quickly and to return to academic, economic activity more quickly. Uh, this, is, this is a tricky, tricky question. There's a lot of data that needs still, I think, to be gathered. As I said, testing has really not been extensive enough in most countries to really understand whether or not this is a feasible strategy. Um, like many people, I've been trying to do the calculations to figure out what we can do. Um, but I think, I think we, we are going to need to slowly step out of our isolation and what that will look like will probably vary from country to country. Um, but there, there needs to be a, a careful calculation about the economic impacts and the health impacts um, and the, the unknowns, the risks that we take as we step out. Because as you've seen, uh, this is something that gets out of control very quickly. And so if we misstep um, and we sort of relax our controls to the point where we have too large an R that spirals out of control very quickly. So as we're doing this relaxing, we need to do extensive testing to understand that our, that our uh, relaxed social distancing um, is not relaxed more than we realized. I am seeing Fewer and fewer questions. Um, I, I apologize, I've missed many of you. Uh, so if there is somebody who I've missed and you feel inclined to post your question again so that it pops to my attention, um, don't be shy. Um, there, oh, oh, I'm going back here. There are a few questions that I missed um, more about targeted quarantine. 
and what that can mean. Um, it potentially means uh, a variety of things. Uh, if we get to the point where we have the ability to certify that individuals are immune from the disease to test and certify that easily, um, we potentially have a population who've recovered from the disease and are free to go about their business. And in particular, they're incredibly valuable because for the period of time that they're immune and can't transmit the disease to others, uh, they would be ideal people to work in close contact with the most vulnerable in our society. Um, so I imagine something that we will see is that uh, the state of being immune from COVID-19 may actually be quite valuable uh, to our society, not just for the purposes of research, but for the purposes of being able to serve in high contact roles um, while still providing great protection to the individuals you interact with. Um, and then those folks who are very vulnerable um, to this disease, I think we'll, we'll need to, to continue to, to use uh, precautions that don't look like our previous normal life for an extended period of time, unfortunately. Um, there's, there's the concern not just to the individual, but also the sort of societal concern uh, that high-risk populations, if the disease reaches them, will rapidly, rapidly overwhelm our healthcare systems. Um, and then we'll see bad outcomes for everyone. Uh, so it's, it's not just about an individual's health. It's, it's, a, it's a broader concern. So um, how does the simple model explain the decline of cases in China and South Korea? Um, so the, the model is certainly leaves out many, many things, but um, at the most basic level, what, what seems to be going on in China and South Korea is that they've successfully um, introduced dramatic social distancing. Um, also, both of these countries have systems in place that attempt to uh, do some form of individualized tracking of the spread of the disease or the risk of it, that individuals may be, have been infected so that they can more quickly identify people who need to be tested and isolated and treated. Um, and there are definitely serious concerns about how this is being done in many parts of the world about uh, surveillance and privacy. Um, there are ways to do this much better than it's currently being done um, pretty much anywhere. I, in terms of maintaining privacy while still being able to uh, protect society. Um, but it seems that there's that this sort of quick detection and uh, fairly severe social distancing is working. But as I said, it's working as long as you keep it up. Um, and I think we will see that if these measures are substantially relaxed, we will see resurgence. Um, yes, uh, so someone says, uh, with time, we're going to learn more. We're going to learn more about treatments. We're going to learn more about vaccinations. We'll have more data. Uh, we'll have better models. All of that is absolutely true. Um, and I think I, one of the, the most uh, important reasons, actually, to try to slow things down is because we will be smarter about our adversary in many, many ways if we buy ourselves some more time. There are a lot of amazing people working around the clock in order to help us beat this thing. Um, can I expand a bit on the ways to help uh, do, do this sort of uh, contact tracing without hurting privacy? Um, sure, so there are a couple of different models that are being used right now for doing contact tracing. Um, I'll, let me set aside the ones that are uh, not even sort of made public and let's focus on the ones that involve asking people to download an application to their cell phone. Um, there's one category of these approaches that asks people to have their cell phone track their GPS location at all times. Um, and then uh, the, the approach that's, that's used in the Israeli version of this application, Home Again, uh, is that Essentially, when somebody is diagnosed with COVID-19, the government 
gets the trace of their location for the past couple of weeks. And then every day the government publishes the trace histories of all of the diagnosed people. They do this with you know, some degree of anonymization, but not anything that you can really uh, call anonym anonymization because you can't really uh, anonymize location data. Um, it's just too revealing of who it is. And so basically the people who have been sick have no privacy, but those of us who have not yet gotten the disease uh, receive these uh, traces of potentially contaminated locations and our phone can check whether we've been in any of those places around the same time as the people who were diagnosed and then alert us that, that we were uh, at risk. This can potentially be done with um, some better protection of privacy for people who are sick. Um, you don't necessarily need to actually reveal the, the full traces. Um, and there are versions of this, this where, where in the government doesn't even really need to know where anyone was, including the folks who were diagnosed. Um, so another uh, technology that gets used in some of these applications, uh, I think it's being used in Singapore right now, is Bluetooth. And what you should think of this is, as your phone isn't recording uh, where it is, and using that as the check, what it's doing is it's talking to all of the phones around it um, at sort of all times. And when it meets another phone um, at close enough range uh, for a long enough period of time, those two phones can agree on a random number. And they can both keep that random number. So each person you meet, for long enough where there's a risk of infection, your phones record a random number. That random number doesn't say anything about who you are, or who the other person was, doesn't say anything about where and when you met. Um, and then when somebody's diagnosed, the government can publish the list of random numbers that, uh, that their phone generated over the past couple of weeks. And then my phone can check whether any of the random numbers that it has were published. If it's, and if so, it means my phone met somebody who was diagnosed. But that information doesn't reveal to, to anyone else or to the government who I met, where I was, when I was there. Um, and so this is a much more appealing privacy solution. I don't think that any government is currently doing anything along these lines with sort of substantial mind to, to privacy, security, um, cryptogra cryptography, but there are plenty of researchers talking about these kinds of ideas. Um, Okay, lots more questions popped up while I was talking and talking. Um, let's see. In the model, does everyone eventually get the virus? Um, no, so as we saw in those last couple of slides, I can even try to go back a little bit so you can see. Um, not necessarily everybody is going to get the disease. Um, even if we never get ourselves to a vaccine, if we can keep our effective R low enough, for example, in this picture, if our effective R is one and a half, which I think is maybe actually completely realistic without um, really major interference in day-to-day -day life, uh, then, then we get to the point where only about 60% of the population ever needs to get the disease um, before it dies out. Now, 60% is still a lot, but if we can get our effective R even lower, then we'll have even fewer people need to have the disease before we have collectively enough immunity around. Um, am I concerned about the rate of the disease skyrocketing after easing up on lockdowns? Absolutely, yes. Um, what else did I miss here? Uh, are there models for selective quarantine under development? I, I hear lots of conversations, but uh, this is a bit outside my expertise. I should remind you I'm a computer scientist. Um, so I'm more on the mathematical modeling side of things. Um, maybe you actually meant mathematical models of selective quarantine rather than uh, more policy models, but I, I, don't, I don't have detailed information about that. Um, we have lots more questions. I apologize, it's gonna take me a second here to, to sort through them. Um, what are the implications for health insurance? Yes, obviously, I, anybody who's trying to, to figure out what's going to happen economically uh, needs, to, needs to think about uh, how and who is going to pay for the care of all the affected individuals. 
Um, obviously, this is something that looks different in Israel than it does in the US. Um, and I, I'm not sure I have anything particularly deep to say about that. Um, so why have previous respiratory diseases like SARS um, not, not spread as far? Um, I'm not an expert in SARS. Actually, I haven't looked closely at a lot of information about it. Um, but my understanding is that, I shouldn't speak to SARS, but at least some diseases that have looked quite, quite scary have in some sense been too effective for their own good. What do I mean by this? If a disease kills people very, very quickly and makes those people very, very sick very, very quickly, then people who get the disease get to the hospital fast because they feel terrible. And then they die or they suffer in the hospital, um, but they don't spend a lot of time walking around giving the disease to other people. And that's part of why the current disease that we're looking at, this coronavirus, is so problematic is because it's making a lot of people not very sick. And those people, maybe they don't realize they have the disease or maybe they just don't feel terrible for a while at the beginning, they walk around and they have a chance to give that disease to a lot of other people. Diseases that make people very ill very quickly or kill them off very quickly, while they're really scary, they tend not to spread nearly as well. And so that may be one reason why this is looking different from some others that we've seen. Okay, more questions. Um, um, I am not, a, so someone asked about uh, stockpiles of ventilators, ICU equipment, uh, drugs. I hear in the news, like all of us, that um, many countries are going to experience severe shortages of many of these things um, and that accords well with the sort of back of the envelope modeling that I've done based on information that I have but countries are aware of this and are attempting to quickly build up the, the supplies that they need um, and the response that they need and countries are attempting to try to sort of slow the spread, flatten the curve is the term has now become quite common um, in order to not be overwhelmed and to have the supplies that they need. Uh, but as you've seen from, from what we've seen in the news and also from the model, this is something that gets out of control very quickly and um, where we need to act rapidly uh, in order to not be overwhelmed. I think the, the number of questions is starting to die out. Again, I apologize. I know there are many of you who I've not gotten to. Um, if there's anybody else who wants to repeat a question that I missed, you are very welcome to do so. Um, and if not, thank you all for the great questions. It's been a pleasure. I should repeat again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm a computer scientist. Um, I'm not giving you any medical advice here. I'm, I'm just trying to, to give you sort of my perspective on what we can learn from some simple mathematical models. Oh, there's one question um, that, I, I, that I think I missed from before that let me, let me take before I say goodbye. Um, so there's, there's a question of, you know, how well can, could one, if one wanted to, I use uh, mobile phone tracking information uh, to try to um, minimize having large numbers of people in the same place. In my mind, that's probably not a very effective tool and certainly the, the harm in, in the tracking is probably not uh, worth it for I think, I think you would get out, at least for what I think you have in mind there. Um, but I, I do think that we will need to have, continue to have measures in place that, that limit the size of gatherings where there could be large spread uh, because that's one of the things that, that caused the numbers to, to jump quickly. Um, and with that, I thank you again. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure talking with you in this, uh, in this remote format, and I wish you all good health. Stay safe. Thank you to you, Professor Ligette. Really thank you for your, your very interesting lecture, and uh, I hope you enjoyed. I will send, as I wrote in the chat, the recordings in the next days and uh, hope to see you in our next net webinars next week thank you great thanks thank you all. All.